that's not a race. That's but the language. Language. That's not a race. I will not suffer that at all. I will not accept that as America. Here they come. We're having a disorderly barbecue. What is a disorderly barbecue? The Trump administration's new rule severely limiting who can claim asylum after crossing the U.S.-Mexico border took effect today. Under this rule, anyone traveling over the southern border has to file an asylum claim in the first country they arrive in after leaving their own and be denied before being allowed to make a claim in the U.S. The ACLU has filed suit against the restrictions, arguing they circumvent existing immigration law. After three days of protests demanding the resignation of Puerto Rico's governor, Ricardo Rosseo said today that after a, quote, process of introspection, he's made a decision to keep being the governor. Protesters are furious over the content of a leaked group chat between him and nine of his officials, four of whom have already been fired or have resigned over messages that used misogynistic and homophobic slurs and made derogatory comments about Rosseo's opponents. The Department of Health and Human Services says it will immediately begin enforcing an anti-abortion rule that blocks federal funds for clinics that refer patients for the procedure. The rule also requires clinics to financially separate any service that involves abortion from the rest of their practice. Although federal funding for abortion is already illegal, clinics have been using the family planning grants for other health services, like cancer screenings or STI testing. French Environment Minister François de Rougy resigned after an investigative group accused him of using taxpayer money to renovate his apartment and host lavish dinners. De Rougy argues he's been defamed and says the dinners were work functions, which he didn't even personally enjoy, saying he can't eat lobster, dislikes oysters, hates caviar, and avoids champagne because it gives him a headache. President's not a racist. But the comments, well, what about the comments? And I think the tone of all of this is not good for the country. But it's coming from all different ideological points of view. That's the point. Uh, to single out any segment of this, I think, is a mistake. Is this good politics for Republicans? That's what it looks like to try to get your momentum back while also trying to ignore the racism tornado swirling around you. But who can blame the majority leader, really? Things were going so well for the Republicans there for a moment. Democrats were infighting about race at the primary debate, and the fissures among Democrats in Congress were playing out on cable in the pages of the New York Times. Then, well, the president did what the president does sometimes. He tweeted. He tweeted some racist shit. Does it concern you that many people saw that tweet as racist and that uh, white nationalist groups are finding common cause with you on that point? It doesn't concern me because many people agree with me. And all I'm saying, they want to leave, they can leave. Now, it doesn't say leave forever. Sidebar, that go back to your country construction is very thinly veiled code for, you don't look like me, so you'll never be welcome here no matter where you were born. Moving on, all that left an opening for the four Democratic freshmen that the tweets targeted, one of whom fled here as a child to become an American citizen, and the other three were, you know, born here. I also would like to just underscore the fact that despite the occupant of the White House attempts to marginalize us and to silence us, please know that we are more than four people. We ran on a mandate to advocate for and to represent those ignored, left out, and left behind. While Trump did what Trump does, the House did what the House does passed a mostly toothless resolution that condemned the president's, quote, racist comments that have legitimized an increased fear and hatred of new Americans and people of color. These comments from the White House are disgraceful and disgusting, and these comments are racist. So if what the president was going for was symbolically uniting the Democratic Party while once again leaving Republicans on the Hill trying to figure out how to answer and or avoid our producer's questions about his remarks, well played. Congressman, do you have a few minutes to talk no, about Trump's tweets? Right do you have a few minutes to chat? Yeah, they are. I can't because I'm late for conference. Okay. If a member of your family was told to go back home, how would you receive that? Well, you know, if they don't like living here and they want to go back to Wales, then that's where they should go. Politically for Republicans, this points to a bigger problem that the party has been aware of for years. They laid it out pretty well after they lost the White House in 2012. 
Remember that GOP autopsy report after President Obama won? Page seven, subject heading, America looks different. In it, the party wrote, quote, if we want ethnic minority voters to support Republicans, we have to engage them and show our sincerity. While the test case of 2016 showed that perhaps the Republican Party didn't need to follow through with their own analysis immediately, 2018 was a hint at what demographic changes in this country could mean for the party in the long term, according to Dr. Matt Barreto, a UCLA political science professor and pollster. I think there's, there's two things that are happening. One are the demographic changes that are taking place in this country in which the number of older conservative white voters is getting smaller as a share of the electorate, and the number of younger Latino, African-American, Asian-American voters is getting larger. We're just having massive demographic change. But number two is that even within the white voters who um, Trump had won in 2016, even assuming there's the same number of overall white voters, the number who are hardcore Trump supporters is shrinking. Trump lost ground in 2018 in all of the exit polls and precinct data and election results that they confirmed that. McConnell has this data. Trump has this data. And even though midterms aren't presidential election years, they know what it means for 2020. If new voters then and beyond see the grand old party as consciously aligned with the kind of things the president likes to tweet, it'll be harder to get those voters to believe the party can represent them. And that's a problem even after Trump is no longer their leader. Okay, so my count of three, all right? One, two, three. While Republicans defended President Trump over his comments about four congresswomen, his daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, was playing offense. Ladies! Wait a minute, y'all are gonna have to help me out here. I'm a little confused because I didn't think women supported Donald Trump. Do we feel differently in this room about that narrative? The launch of Women for Trump in Pennsylvania was a who's who of Trumpettes. And yes, Donald Trump built that. Trump derangement syndrome, okay? I said, are we all on the Trump train? All aboard! All aboard! Hillary Clinton won 54% of the female vote in 2016. Trump won 42 percent. It's Laura Trump's job to get those numbers up in 2020, no matter what her father-in-law tweets. We want to inspire women to get out there, talk to their friends, talk to their neighbors, talk to their co-workers, and, and really make it okay to outwardly support Donald Trump. I just really think that uh, there is a hidden vote out there when it comes to women. We saw it in 2016. All the polls said that he would not get the support of women, that he would not win the election as a whole, and we saw that to be wrong. In the last few days, there's been a national conversation about tweets that the president sent about four congresswomen of color. He told them to go back to the countries from which they came. Does that help you with women voters when he tweets things like that? Well, just to clarify, he never specifically specifically referenced a country, go back to your country. He just said, go back to where you came from. He, he said, though, he said the countries whose governments are a complete and total catastrophe, the worst, most corrupt and inept anywhere in the world. And if those women are from the United States, what country is he referring to then? Well, I, I don't know specifically about that. I mean, you can you can dice this up and you can, you know, specifically look at every single portion of what he said. But overall, I think what you saw reflected there was a very big frustration on his part. This is a man who whose life is a lot harder being our president. Donald Trump was a person who everybody as a whole generally liked before he ran for president. He gets hit every single day. He gets attacked every single day. And he's out there fighting for this country because he loves America. He loves the people of this country. And when you continually see people like these particular women out there calling our country garbage and constantly saying negative things about it and dumping on our country, it becomes very frustrating. Did you think that those tweets were racist to tell no. them to go back to where they all. came from? No. Why not? 
That's it's just it's a talking point that is always used against any Republican, especially this president. I know Donald Trump, he's not a racist. How does all of this help you win re-election right now if he's stoking racial divides in this country. Well, I'll tell you what does help us win, things like the First Step Act. This is the first president in the history of this country to pass comprehensive prison reform. What Donald Trump has done and his administration but has done will tensions. primarily help the, the black communities in this country, and you can't ignore that. And unfortunately, the racial tensions get stoked many times by the media. This crowd today was predominantly white, how do you bring in Hispanic women and African-American women and other women of color into this campaign? Really, the whole goal is to encourage people, whether you're a woman, whether you're a black American, Hispanic American, to, to really reflect on this president and, and their life. And if things are better for them right now than they were three years ago, then that means something. And it means that this president is doing a good job for you. People come into our country illegally, we're taking them out legally. President Trump's big threat that immigration and customs enforcement agents would target families with deportation orders this weekend never came to much. Unlike after other mass raids, ICE hasn't publicized how many people were apprehended. And in Houston, at least, there was news that only two men were arrested. But the threat was enough to mobilize the city's activists and politicians and to spread fear. And I thank you for your patience. Everybody good on mics? We're doing good on mics? Okay. Today is a very somber day. The President of the United States issued an order of mass deportation. In Chicago, Atlanta, San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles, Houston, Texas. How do you say to people, we are not going to give you a chance to find a piece of paper, call your lawyer, or that you have a four-year-old at home and there's nobody else there. I will not suffer that at all. I will not accept that as America. Grandma has thick hair. Oh. She got that Pocahontas hair. <laughs> I arrived here when I was three years old with my mother. Man, Gracie's hair is a workout. <laughs> my arm hurts. I'm currently undocumented. I tried to apply for DACA, and I wasn't able to apply for the simple fact that I didn't have proofs from 10 years ago that I hadn't left the country. You know, I was thinking the other day. I was thinking, you know how, like, they say, like, Donald Trump is, like, such a horrible president? What if he's just, like, the lightweight? of a worse one to come. Like, what if he's like nice compared to another one that could possibly come? I don't want to say I'm scared because I don't want to give them that power to let they know that I'm scared. But I am scared. What's going to happen to my kids? Nobody's going to take care of my kids like I do. Move, boy, I'm trying to get my shoes. I can't live in the shadows. It's like letting them win. You're letting hate win if you're living in fear. I know I didn't have no control over it either. It's not my fault either. So it's definitely not their fault. I shouldn't hold them back from living life. No, no phone. So I need to put them up. I better not see phones and tablets out during church. Mommy, I'm taking, I'm taking it to my for a Bible. It. It's to the point to where every time I go out to eat, I'm like, I wonder what, when it's going to be my last meal with my family because stuff happens so quick. Like, people are minding their business, and then before you know it, they're in jail. We are still what? We are still what? So we are all in one big family. Are y'all with me? Come on, somebody. And sometimes I just, like, get sad because I'm just thinking what happens if, if she won't come back in years and one day my, my baby sister Penelope or Dusty don't remember her because they haven't seen her in years. Donald Trump said he'll make the world better but he hasn't made the, the world better yet if he's just going to separate us. 
Immigration and Customs Enforcement expecting to round up 2,000 illegal immigrants with final deportation orders this morning. Houston, one of the 10 cities where those efforts are being focused. That's new. It says there, if the police or immigration knocks on your door, you may refuse to open the door or to answer the door. That's brand new. And I drive the street every day. <laughs> that, <laughs> that tells you, that tells you what's on people's minds. It says police <laughs> knocking on your door. It doesn't say specifically just immigration. It says police. Ah, so unfortunate. So unfortunate. There's a lot of fear. That's the biggest challenge that we face every day, trying to breaking down those barriers of, of fear. For law enforcement, it's very damaging. We have people that have witnessed crimes that are no longer gonna call the police to say what happened. They'd rather just keep it to themselves. Why would they? If all of a sudden we're gonna be asking for the papers, I mean, which we're not, but that's that's the perception. And then we have to we have to break that. Um, negativity, that distrust again, and that's going to take a while. <laughs> My mom said we can't go to Mexican restaurants for a little while. Like going to places like taco trucks, water parks and stuff, because sometimes they'll look for immigrants over there. I knew that my mom was from Mexico, but I never knew that they could like deport you. Donald Trump just thinks like immigrants are all bad people. Like, everybody is bad that, that are not from the United States. <laughs> Nearly five years to the day after Eric Garner died at the hands of police, federal prosecutors announced they won't bring charges against New York police officer Daniel Pantaleo, who had Garner in a chokehold. Garner's family is asking that Pantaleo at least be fired. Five years ago, my son said, I can't breathe 11 times. And today we can't breathe. Because they have let us down. Garner's death ignited a wave of protests against the NYPD. It also helped extinguish a controversial policing tactic known as stop and frisk. The idea was officers could temporarily detain and search anyone they reasonably suspected of having a weapon in order to reduce gun violence. At its peak in 2011, police used the tactic almost 700,000 times, but shootings and murders pretty much stayed at the same levels. What did happen was the number of stops of young black males exceeded the actual number of young black men in the city of New York. And 90% of the young black and Latino men stopped were innocent. We've been here for a long time. The cops constantly harassed us. They come here and see the same faces every day. It was horrible. I'm saying five years ago, and them cops was horrible to us. We sit here, we barbecue for the kids. Here they come, we having a disorderly barbecue. What is a disorderly barbecue? The relationship with the police in this community is complicated. I think it depends on how long you've been here. There's a lot of intentionality of, you know, the police department reaching out and trying to be more present in the community, but it doesn't ignore the fact that there's just, there's history and hurt there, and I think we're, as a community, still trying to navigate the relationship with the police department. Every Garner death played out in so many ways in this community. I would say predominantly for those of us who are minorities, we all felt like it could have been us. I got the chief of department job in November of 2014. And at the end of that month was the Ferguson decision, and then the Garner decision, and then uh, at the protest. Those protested lasted you know, three or four weeks. At times it was three or 4,000 people. And one Saturday it was 30,000 people protesting against us. And in New York City, you know, there are demonstrations every day, but this was different. This was directed towards us. Heads up! Don't shoot! Heads up! Don't shoot! 
at that time I had 30, 34 years as a police officer. It was the most difficult time I've ever been through. And it, uh, it culminated in uh, the assassination of Joe Lou and Rafael Ramos. New York's finest, their badges banded in black, stood in silence at 2.47, marking the dark moment here on Tompkins Avenue in Bedford-Stuyvesant, when a gunman fatally shot officers Wenjin Liu and Rafael Ramos. If anything is going to make you change, it's going to be tragedy. And uh, from that day forward, from the day we buried Joe Liu, I knew, and Bill Bratton knew, that we had to change the way we do business. We embarked on it in May of 2015 with neighborhood policing. We actually came out in the academy together, so we've both been on. August will make five years. No, actually July. July will make five years. Uh, been in seven nine precinct our whole whole career. I'm from Brooklyn, Bed Stuy, Brooklyn. Born and raised. Still got majority of my friends out here, and uh, now. Uh, work out here. It's always fun to come back and see familiar faces. Now I'm in the uniform, so I get a lot of warm looks sometimes. I'm like, what do you do to ring the bell? Like 40 we times? ask them to change the way they do business. Crime is down significantly, but with that, our arrests are down. Not everybody needs to get a summons. Not everybody needs to get arrested. That's the whole idea behind neighborhood policing. If you have the same cops in the same neighborhood every day, they know who is who. They know who the bad guys are. And as long as the enforcement is being done, it should be directed at people involved in violence and crime. Jordan. Yo. What up? What's up, man? How's everything? Good, good. You coming for practice? No, I'm just working out a lot. They let you work out over there? I have a membership. Oh, all right. All right. All right, later, bro. Everybody was excited for me to become a police officer and to help continue to, you know, help people. That's what I enjoy doing. They wanted me, they wanted to see me follow my dreams. So for me, it was positive. Mm. Well, for me, it was secretive. Um, only people that really knew was my immediate family. My wife, my kids, my parents, handful of cousins, if that, ultimately sometimes it was a little challenging putting on a uniform and hearing a lot of ridicule because I decided to put that uniform on. Sometimes people won't accept your decisions and they feel that when you join a department like this, that you aren't staying true to your culture and to your values. But I specifically joined to make a difference. How are you guys? Hey, Those make a man. Hey, I'm just saying that. I, this is my uniform from the other shop. It's been something that has allowed relationships and a little bit more trust for some people in our neighborhood. It, it's um, really allowed I'm sorry, Jay. some things to be a lot easier to accept and deal with, especially during these times when there's been so much policing issues. They stay really involved, they check on you just to check on you, and um, they've been a great help. So Good to see you, man. Good to see y'all. Always a pleasure. Appreciate you homework, man. I think they realized after a certain amount of time that all we wanted to do was sit here and, and enjoy ourselves and have fun. We weren't starting no trouble, we weren't fighting, we weren't using drugs, we weren't doing anything illegal. <laughs> we had the sergeant come here and say, you know, we got a call that y'all having something disorderly. I came through here twice. What's disorderly? What's disorderly? He, he come out and he said, let me get a frame and let me get a water. <laughs> and he pulled off. That made us so happy. What's important about that is the police took the time to find out who we are. Plain and simple. People have told me to go back where I come from so many times. I was having some conflicts with a girl in school, and you know, that's just the card that she decided to pull. You know, like, go back to where you came from. 
I was really shocked. I didn't really know what to say. I mean, when you're confronted by someone who's so hateful for no reason, it's, you're just, I was at a loss for words. I've been told to go back to the country where I'm from, uh, more specifically to go to a nail salon where I belong uh, by a girl who was upset that I was dating my then African-American boyfriend um, in middle school. I mean, I was this, I was this uh, eight-year-old kid, you know, in, South, in Southwest Houston, actually, at the time, walking to the store, and these two uh, older Caucasian gentlemen told me that on, as I was walking, they pulled up beside me and told me that, called me the N-word. I, 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 I didn't know what was going on, but now, you know, I, I think, how can two grown men have the audacity to tell a child that? Una vez le tocó a mía que le dijeron que se regresara a Guatemala y le dio risa porque ella es nacida acá, yo soy de México. It made me feel angry because I was born here, I was raised here, I speak English, I speak Spanish. I feel like I have a right to be here just as much as anybody else. When I hear someone say to go back to the country where they belong, it makes me realize that there's such a prevalent anger and hatred of ethnic people in the United States of America. A kid named well, I don't want to say his name. It could be me. Um, he, I was talking to him about ramen noodle, and he said, where are you from? I said, Korea. And he said, are you from North Korea? You could be dangerous. You should go back to your country. You could be related to Kim Jong-un. Are you a secret spy? I'm like, no. To hear the same words that came out of the mouth of like a sixth grade girl come out of the mouth as a president of the United States of America, is really shocking to me.